loved movie stars, her films watched by millions. Let's start from the beginning again, Jeff. Tell me everything you saw. Her Hollywood movies have stood the test of time, but her screen career lasted just five years. I think of amazing performances like High Noon, the Hitchcock films. Grace had this brief and remarkable career. Grace Kelly projected onto the screen this kind of untouchable image, and at the same time, she's available. Tabloid rumors pursued Grace Kelly throughout her life. She had to issue a public statement to Hollywood saying, I never meant to have an affair with, with a married man. At the height of her fame, she surprised everybody, swapping her Hollywood royalty for real royalty. Now, by civil authority and by the church, Prince Rainier and his film star bride have been pronounced man and wife. When the wedding did come, it really was an unparalleled event in terms of glamour and significance. Her star quality transformed the fortunes of Monaco, the tiny principality on the French Riviera. A picture queen meets her new subjects and is greeted by them in turn. But was Princess Grace the one role she didn't enjoy playing? She did not really understand exactly how much of a bubble you live in, like Diana did not, like Meghan Markle did not. Princess Grace gave Diana a piece of advice. Don't worry, dear, it'll only get worse. And of course it did. What's the truth behind the rumors? As well as an heir, did Prince Rainier demand a dowry payment from Grace? Grace had to show up with not only her glamour and her cachet, but with her checkbook. Those close to the story reveal the truth about her life. A lot of fairy tales do have a dark side to them, and perhaps her life did too. And the story behind her fatal car crash. The car was simply going too fast ever to have a chance of getting around that bend. And so Grace Kelly has died. This, of course, was the end of the romance, and it was terribly tragic. In 1956, the tiny principality of Monaco was to have a new princess, and the world's media went wild. When news broke that Grace Kelly was to marry this European prince, to become a bona fide princess, I think Hollywood was enchanted. It was one of the first truly global media events. The bride drives with her father through the streets on her way to the Cathedral of St. Nicholas. An estimated 30 million people tuned in to watch them. Some of this wedding footage is newly unearthed. It's thought it's not been seen for years. It turns out to be one of the royal spectaculars of the mid-20th century. 600 people in the Monaco Cathedral. A lot of Hollywood greats there. Arthur Gardner, Harry Grant, David Niven. Aristotle and Nassis is there. Hollywood just loved it. It was notable that MGM made Grace Kelly a present of the wedding dress. It was designed by a Hollywood designer, Helen Rose, with a huge amount of work and a huge amount of fabric. Now, by civil authority and by the church, Prince Rainier and his film star bride have been pronounced man and wife. Grace was just 26 when she stepped down from Hollywood to marry her very own Prince Charming. Rainier had taken the throne seven years previously, but the Grimaldi royal family had ruled for 700 years. It's easy to think of the marriage to Rainier as this attractive fairy tale package, but actually it was a monumental decision. She left the uh, country of her birth, where her family lived, in order to marry this man. And it's an incredibly strong and brave decision to make. An international playground, this coastline along the blue Mediterranean has become the mecca for those who have been captivated by its charm. Monaco, a glamorous destination for the world's elite. Smaller than New York's Central Park, it's one of the most densely populated sovereign states in the world. Monaco had no income tax. Its principal revenue came from Monte Carlo's famed gambling casino. The income more than covered the tiny country's needs. It nestles between the Mediterranean and France. Monaco is a country in its own right. It's defended by the French government militarily, but for that to continue, there had to be an heir. 
from the reigning prince. There was this um, clause that if he didn't have an heir, then uh, Monaco would go to the French Republic. The actress was now Her Serene Highness Princess of Monaco. But before her marriage, she'd been the queen of pictures and ahead of her time. We've seen with Meghan Markle how difficult it is for somebody from Hollywood to adapt to a country in Europe. But if you can imagine going back all those years to somebody who was one of the biggest names in Hollywood, moving to a tiny principality where she was the member uh, of a royal family that literally lived in a, in a bubble. It must have been quite extraordinary. He joins Paramount Pictures President Barney Balaban and Mrs. Balaban. Hollywood in the 1950s was in its heyday. Run by the big studios, it sold a glamorous dream as it churned out pictures for the silver screen full of beauty and style. Grace's was not the usual showbiz rags to riches story. She was from a wealthy family from Philadelphia. She'd modeled before being spotted on Broadway and landing her big break in the iconic genre-defining Western, High Noon. And will the bride and groom kindly step forward? Grace Kelly was cast as the wife of Gary Cooper in High Noon. And you look on the screen, you can see she's, she's at least 20, 25 years younger than he is. Please, Will. If you just tell me what this is all about. What Grace Kelly embodies with that Puritan look, the bonnet on her head, the kind of Quaker cleanness is the moral compass of the town itself. Rumors of onset romances with her sometimes married leading men became commonplace in the tabloids. Hollywood tended to cast her opposite actors twice her age. Grace Kelly was the opposite of the image that she projected, and a lot of Hollywood wives were not happy with that, but she did what she wanted to do. In the 50s, women had to be pure and untarnished. Grace was a bit of a rebel, but took her craft seriously. Director Alfred Hitchcock would cement her in the public's consciousness forever as the cool, icy blonde. He liked the fact that Grace Kelly projected onto the screen this kind of untouchable image, and at the same time, she's available. Alfred Hitchcock would say, with a brunette and a redhead, you kind of expected explosions, you expected something to happen, but not with an icy blonde. They embodied suspense, Hello? which is what Hitchcock was all about. So Grace Kelly was his ideal. Hello. Hitchcock tested this theory in their first film together, the tightly wound thriller, Dial M for Murder. Hello. Grace gives an electrifying performance as an unfaithful wife who is stalked by a crook hired by her cuckolded husband. Hitchcock loved necks, and the rope around the neck was the ultimate thing, the strangulation. So in this scene, the guy throws her backwards in her negligee over the desk, strangling her on top of her. Basically, he's raping her, you know, without doing it. To kill it. That's Hitchcock in a nutshell, and Grace knew exactly what he was doing. This is Hitchcock's most blatant statement about her as his muse. Despite her icy image and strict Catholic upbringing, the actress could happily banter away with the director. He used to try and shock her by telling bawdy jokes, and he loved how she responded. Famously, he said, do I shock you, Miss Kelly? She said, oh, no, I went to a girls' convent school, Mr Hitchcock. I heard all those things by the time I was 13. Grace was always seen as this perfect 1950s lady. But deep down, she was a very independent and driven person. And, you know, she wasn't afraid of having a, a sex life. She wasn't afraid of having affairs. Um, she wasn't afraid of following her heart. Grace followed her heart during filming on Dial M for Murder and had an affair with her on-screen husband, Ray Milland. It put her fledgling career in jeopardy. She really messed up when she had an affair with him. She had to 
issue a public statement to Hollywood saying, never meant to have an affair with, with a married man. Growing up, Grace was said to have had a difficult relationship with her family. She defied her father to become an actress. He didn't see her as having any of the star quality that everybody else could see. Grace Kelly always had to prove something to her father. She was the third child of, of four. So it wasn't that Grace wasn't loved, but she maybe wasn't noticed. Intelligent and from a wealthy family, her background certainly drove her on to succeed. If her hard work with Hitchcock had boosted her career, her next film, the modest romance Country Girl, would be the making of it. Oh, no, not me, thank you. I'm just a girl from the country. The theater and the people in it have always been a complete mystery to me. In minimal makeup and unfashionable clothes, Grace was cast against her icy blonde type as the wife of an alcoholic singer played by Bing Crosby. When did you get these, Frank? Last night after you fell asleep. No more, Frank. It was rumored they carried the relationship off screen, too. When we get to Boston, I'll get you some sleeping pills. Even in the country girl playing in those incredibly dowdy clothes, Grace made it look good and classy. Whether you like it or not, Frank's weak. He's a leaner. And I happen to be the one he leans on. Hollywood loves to reward actors and actresses who gain weight or lose weight for pictures or who look very dowdy and very much against their elegant image. Just 25 and one of the youngest ever Oscar winners when she lifted the coveted trophy. The Oscar was presented by rumored former flame, William Holden. I can only say thank you with all my heart to all who made this possible for me. After just four years in film, she was the toast of Hollywood. The success of The Country Girl was a pivotal moment that not only changed her professional life, but personal life too. It was through the film she met Prince Rainier of Monaco. It's a strange series of coincidences that brings Grace and Rainier together. She was asked to go to the Cannes Film Festival to promote The Country Girl, and then Parry and Match wanted to do a photo shoot, so they were thinking, how can we have an interesting photo shoot? about Hollywood royalty with actual royalty. The magazine arranged for a PR shoot with Rainier at his palace in the Principality. He'd ascended the throne in 1949, a dashing war hero. He'd seen action and was awarded the French Croix de Guerre with Bronze Star. Six years Grace's senior, their meeting didn't get off to the best of starts. The electricity was out in her hotel, so she had to a frumpy dress and style her hair herself. She had to pull it back in a bun. She also didn't have a hat. She didn't know she was supposed to wear a hat, so she borrowed a friend's really hideous floral headdress. It was about an hour late, which she was quite frustrated by. But when he did turn up, he was extremely charming to her. They, he showed her around the uh, Disney World-like palace that is Monte Carlo, and they did hit it off. He was educated at a number of British boarding schools. So he did have that kind of cosmopolitan and, of course, English-speaking background that, again, may have helped. She sent a thank you note to Rainier, and they began corresponding. She would make 11 films in five years and found Hollywood ruthless. After numerous unhappy romances and an Oscar win, was she looking for an out and a new life? You know, there he was. Um, handsome, eligible bachelor, living in a palace in the south of France, in Monaco. Um, I don't think she, she... I think she was in love with the idea of being in love. I think she fell in love through his letters, or she fell in like through his letters. I don't know if she ever really loved him. I think she chose her destiny. A year earlier, Grace's destiny had taken her to the south of France for Hitchcock's To Catch a Thief. During filming, she'd fallen in love with the area which would later shape her paper. I mean, it really qualifies as one of the most beautiful films ever made, I think. We have Grace Kelly playing the beautiful American heiress, Francie Stevens, who spies Cary Grant on the beach and decides that this is the man for her. The film is not regarded as one of Hitchcock's best but it's well-remembered for the sparkling interplay between Grant and Kelly. 
Her part in the film appeared to mirror her own life. You're here in Europe to buy a husband. The man I want doesn't have a price. Well, that eliminates me. Grace would indeed catch her husband on the French Riviera when she later married Rainier. It's strange to encapture her life in that we see in the car with Cary Grant with the whole of the Mediterranean and below Monaco that spilled out in front of us. Oh, lovely day. Have you ever seen any place in the world more beautiful? Well, she doesn't know at this time, but she's pointing to the beautiful pink palace of Mon Monaco where she would become the princess. At 26, Grace had it all. She was a style icon, rich, beautiful, an Oscar winner, and had dated some of the most handsome leading men in film. The whole of Hollywood was stunned when she left, really. She arrived like a meteorite. She was a shining star. Six years, she was gone. She turned her back on Hollywood when she landed the biggest role of her life as Princess Grace of Monaco. But was it a part she would later regret playing? Where you see her as a bride in the famous outfit, I think she does look like a bit of a caged bird trapped behind the veil. The Principality of Monaco, an independent state with its own rulers and its own laws. Monaco was already well known for attracting the jet set. An international playground, this coastline along the blue Mediterranean has become the mecca for those who have been captivated by its charm. Its new ruler, Prince Rainier, was the only son. He'd become the direct heir on his 21st birthday. He now wanted to make his principality the ultimate paradise. Not just for millionaires, but wealthy tourists too. Cameras are not allowed to show the faces of gamblers in the casino. Greek shipping tycoon, Aristotle Anassis, was one of the principality's big players. It's often said that Mr. Anassis now controls Monte Carlo. Is that true? His headquarters for his uh, ships and all that are here in Monte Carlo, but he never owned Monaco or anything like it. Is he friendly with Prince Rainier? Why, yes. It's rumoured the prince's friend hatched a plan to enhance Rainier's and the principality's fortunes. So what you really need to do is marry a movie star and that will bring back all the glamour to Monaco. So Onassis himself created a short list of actresses for Rainier to marry. Was Grace Kelly just one of a number of candidates in the mix? Screen goddess Marilyn Monroe, one of Grace's contemporaries, was supposedly on the short list but turned him down. Marilyn Monroe kept referring to Prince Rainier as Prince Reindeer. Whether she did it because she was playing dumb or whether she really did not want to give up a movie career, who knows? But she kept saying, well, I don't know if I want to marry Prince Reindeer. Rainier had been in a long affair which had, had broken up. He found it very, very difficult to sort of meet a woman on equal terms without being harassed and speculated about. It was rumoured Prince Rainier wanted a glamorous and rich wife for another reason, too. There's a law in Monaco that if the prince dies without a male heir, Monaco becomes part of France. At their first meeting in Monaco in the spring, Rainier had been charmed by the beautiful, witty and successful Grace Kelly. Around eight months after their photo shoot, he set sail for America to meet her family. Within three days, he had proposed to Grace, and um, in that time, according to her sister, they fell very much in love. And then a press conference was told that the Prince of Monaco had chosen his princess, and his bride-to-be never looked lovelier. But behind the cameras, there was said to be a tough business deal Rainier wanted thrashed out. In line with royal custom, he allegedly wanted a large dowry. But to the American Kelly family, this seemed bizarre. Grace Kelly was expected to bring to the marriage, not only her high profile glamour, but also quite a large cash dowry, $2 million. When this was first put to Jack Kelly, her father, he said, my daughter Grace doesn't have to pay anyone to marry her. When Rainier came to visit him, 
he was like, hey, I'm the king of Philadelphia. You're, you're in my kingdom now, mister. Grace was determined, despite her father's reservations. There was this sense, in a way, that this was the ultimate role. The information about the money remains unclear. Full financial details of any dowry have never been disclosed. But it's rumored the wealthy actress may have stumped up some of the cash herself. Grace had to show up with not only her glamour and her cachet as an Oscar winning. The people of Monaco received the news of Prince Renier's engagement with joyful enthusiasm. After the wedding, this delightful actress will be known as Her Serene Highness, Princess of Monaco. With the marriage brokered, Grace was still under contract with the studio and had one more film to do, a musical. She was going out on a top note. Grace's final film was High Society, by which time she was engaged to Prince Rainier. And everyone really knew that this was the last film before her wedding. In the best tradition of Hollywood musicals, High Society combines witty and energetic songs with a feel-good storyline. In an echo of Grace Kelly's true-life romance with Prince Rainier, the film revolves around Bing Crosby's attempts to win her heart. I would like to talk to you. Rainier visited the set as their own wedding was only weeks away. You lost a little weight, have you, Sam? She's very thin in high society. It was a very stressful, whirlwind time for her. I just want to know what you are doing here the day before my wedding. It's quite extraordinary to think of uh, Rainier being around the set. He was this world famous prince. Um, they were going to get married, it was all romance, and they were able to spend a bit of time together as a result, getting to know each other. Get in. Did Rainier also want to keep an eye on Grace? Her other co star, Frank Sinatra, was a renowned womanizer, while Crosby was apparently an old flame, constantly wooing her in the movie with romantic ballads. While I give to you and you give. To me, true love. Grace is on the yacht with Bing Crosby, and they're singing true love. And I guess people were thinking that really is mirroring what's going on with her. And of course, it would have been wonderful fodder for the gospel columns. Miss Lord, would you please lift your chin? I thought in a publicity coup for the studio, the actress wears Rainier's ring in the film. Hey, that's some rock you got there, Sam. Do you mind that yourself, George? It was a stunning emerald cut diamond. It rapidly became one of the most famous engagement rings in the world. She was wearing this great gift from the man in her life while she was leaving her old world behind. Sort of couldn't write it in a fairy tale because nobody would believe it, but it did happen. But you're sensational. There's also the idea that she's kind of sending herself up a little bit in high society. There's the number, You're Sensational, when Frank Sinatra serenades her. It's a very sexy number, Ron's goddess, this icy, fair Miss Frigidaire. He can see beneath that, beyond that, that actually she's sensational and that she's warm and sexy and fun. Cause you're sensational. As Grace left Hollywood, she might have hoped she'd be back That's on a film set one day. But this was before Women's Lib, and now her career was out of her hands and in her fiancé's. You said that whether or not you continue your career after your marriage would depend on your career. Yes, that is the decision. Has it already been discussed, may I ask? Oh, yes. I think probably Rainier was controlling. He was older than Grace. He had come from that social background where girls were girls, decorative, and men ran everything. The marriage would be the end of her incredible award-winning career. Within weeks, Grace was leaving her old life behind. It was an amazingly short period between the end of high society and the, the time when she had to leave for Monaco, roughly a month. Grace and her family sailed to Monaco on an eight-day voyage. The move to Monaco is a very, very dramatic change in her life and um, slightly terrifying step 
So she surrounds herself with lots and lots of activity. It's a very exciting thing and I'm very, very happy. Of course, I'm a little sad to be uh, leaving home, but uh, I hope to be back quite often. Here was the princess coming into this amazing port in Monte Carlo. And it seemed everybody who lived in Monaco was out in the streets. It was, it was the stuff of um, fairy tale. It made headlines around the world. The shot was picture perfect, but was the fairy tale real? Would Grace miss the old life she left behind? And would she soon come to tire of her new role? A lot of fairy tales do have a dark side to them, and perhaps her life did too. In little more than five years, Grace Kelly had grown from obscurity on the New York stage to being a world-famous Oscar-winning movie star. And now her life story was about to take a more romantic twist as she became a real-life princess. Joyous day of the religious wedding. It's half past ten and the morning sun shines brightly. Grace married Prince Rainier in Monaco over the course of two days in April 1956 in both civil and religious ceremonies. An event now. All eyes are on her, an entrancing picture in her magnificent gown as she takes her place before the high altar. The ceremony was filmed by MGM and by TV companies who broadcast it to 30 million viewers around the world. There was the civil ceremony on one day, then the religious ceremony at the cathedral the next, attended by so many guests, including Hollywood royalty, Cary Grant, David Niven, Ava Gardner. We're now out of the 40s, the world has settled down after the Second World War, and this is glamour. This was the stuff that, you know, dreams are made of, and I, I can still see that picture, black and white, of course, in my mind's eye. This was Hollywood with bells on. Couldn't have been any more exciting. When the wedding did come, it really was an unparalleled event in terms of glamour and significance and newsworthiness. Grace's wedding dress is one of the best remembered and most elegant bridal gowns of all time. She didn't order it from a fashion house. It was a gift from her former studio, MGM, and created by Helen Rose, the chief costume designer who had worked on two of Grace's previous films. It's notable that MGM would make Grace a present of the wedding dress. This staggering dress involving vast amounts of fabric, vast amounts, you know, hours and hours of work. The dress had been the subject of intense press interest. Miss Kelly, we understand that you've changed the idea about your gown already. Is that your decision or Helen Rose's at MGM? Oh, no, I don't know where you heard it. It's, uh, it's always been the same. And uh, it's still the original dress that you ran. I understand it took three dozen seamstresses, three weeks, with an estimated cost back then of $7,200. Can you imagine how much it would cost today? It was the beginning of the iconic wedding dress that people dreamed about. Now, by civil authority and by the church, Prince Rainier and his film star bride have been pronounced man and wife. Princess Grace's wedding dress seems to have inspired bridal fashions for more than six decades. Many royal watchers believe that it influenced the design of Kate Middleton's wedding dress in 2011 for her marriage to Prince William. I was reporting for Catherine's wedding, the Duchess of uh, Cambridge's dress, and as soon as I saw it, I thought, Princess Grace, I can see the similarity, I can see the, slightly the high collar, um, lots of lace, and sure with Catherine. You know, it's a very tight bond with your designer. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if she references Grace Kelly's dress. Wouldn't be surprised at all. She didn't possess. Um, she wore this little sort of Juliet cap, beautifully embroidered and decorated, which again allowed a sight of that very beautiful face. Grace and Rainier had invited many VIP guests, such as the Aga Khan of India and the Greek shipping magnate Aristotle Onassis, who first came up with the idea of Rainier marrying a Hollywood star to raise the profile of Monaco. But the restrained European monarchs of the 1950s stayed away. 
It's said that Queen Elizabeth II in England said, no, no, I'm not going, you know, far too many celebrities, far too many Hollywood types. Maybe they were slightly sniffy, and in fact, later, Grace became very, very fat friendly with the British royal family. But, but certainly they didn't seem to be rushing to Monaco. Yes, indeed, it certainly was a great day in the long history of the Principality. A great day for the loyal people of Monaco. Prince Rainier and Princess Grace's first child, Caroline, was born on the 23rd of January, 1957, prompting Monegasques to ring church bells. The couple went on to have two more children, Albert and Stephanie. Caroline, their eldest child, was born nine months, four days after their wedding. So they were very keen to be parents and very keen to provide an heir. And so from really before they'd even celebrated a year together, they were already mother and father to somebody. They then had to live every day, like all of us do, with the ups and downs of every day. At the moment, the little principality is waiting for news of another birth of the palace. News which will be proclaimed by a gun salute. 21 for a girl, 101 for a boy. Grace had been an ambitious film star, but as a commoner who married into a royal family, she found herself working hard to fit into her new role, even hiring a private French tutor. She would have had to learn the accent. She would have had to have learned the ways people speak, uh, how they eat, uh, what they did on Sundays, because it's a, a very conservative Catholic country. She would have been called Her Serene Highness, and she would have had to be serene. So all of that must have taken a toll on her. Whatever the stresses of her new royal life, Princess Grace continued to be a role model for generations to come. She became a style icon perhaps because her own personal style, her figure, those very beautifully cut suits, the dresses with the narrow waist and the huge flaring skirt. When I was growing up in the 60s, um, there were two paper dolls. These were the ideals. You were meant to be a mom, that was your duty, but you never were supposed to gain weight you were supposed to make it all look flawless and beautiful. And that's what we were meant to grow up to be. Perhaps the most enduring fashion statement associated with Princess Grace is the Hermes bag that was named in her honor. When you saw Grace Kelly traveling, apart from the luggage, she always had with her an Hermes handbag. Um, some would say, some would say to hide perhaps her pregnancy from the public, but it was always there, and it's quite a significant look. It became so popular um, that Hermes turned around and called it the Kelly bag, which today, today, it costs a fortune. She liked dark brown and navy and crocodile, which is a little controversial. On their engagement, Grace and Rainier had announced that she would stop making films after the wedding but rumours circulated of tensions in the marriage, that Rainier banned Grace's films from being shown in Monaco and tried to buy up all the copies. As with so much about Grace and Rainier, there, there's rumours that Rainier banned the films, um, but, but I, I'm not sure that that's, that's convincingly the case, because the films were out there. I mean, she made some of the greatest films in movie history. It's like it's great in a story that somebody's made up third hand. The idea that he's going to ban Mogambo or to catch a thief or whatever is sort of ridiculous. It seems that she hadn't quite realised how completely she would have to give up her career. Because it wasn't that long into the marriage that Alfred Hitchcock came calling with a very, very spectacular role. In 1962, Alfred Hitchcock offered Grace the chance to make a fourth film together. The title character, Marnie, would have been her greatest acting challenge yet. But when news broke of her casting, it caused an outcry. The Monegasques didn't want their beloved princess in a Hollywood film. They certainly wouldn't have, I suspect, if they'd known that there was a rape scene in the film. Despite the controversial script, Rainier was apparently relaxed about his wife taking part. But Grace was forced to withdraw after suffering a miscarriage, the second since the birth of their son, Albert, in 1958. She wrote to her friends saying that it was a catastrophe and she was very, very shaken. 
She also then wrote to Hitch and said, I'm terribly sorry, I can't, it can't do the film. He said, it's only a movie, I entirely understand why. Alfred Hitchcock eventually cast Tippi Hedren in Grace's role. The devout monogasques might have found the trauma. Sean Connery rapes Tippi Hedren in this film. It's in a marriage, and in those days, that rape didn't uh, exist legally in marriage. But that's what happens. Of course, we can't see it, but it's implied. <laughs> day after that she attempts to kill herself so this is an incredibly dark and disturbing storyline it's very hard to see princess of monaco playing that role i'm sure renier didn't want grace to take part in that biographers later contradicted the rumors that renier had effectively killed off grace's acting career I think it was a great source of sadness to Grace that she wasn't able to play Marnie. And I think she then had to accept, really, that she wasn't going to go back to Hollywood and make Hollywood films again. Gossip was rife about Rainier's controlling nature, and the rumours about their relationship continued in the years ahead. There were rumours of various, uh, what they used to call toy boys, and she had a flat in Paris, and there were all kinds of stuff about affairs and all of this. She was a good person, and she didn't hurt anybody. After turning down the role of Marnie in Alfred Hitchcock's 1962 film, Princess Grace never again returned to screen acting. She balanced her time as the wife of Prince Rainier, the mother of three children, and her various state duties. During the 1970s, she made tours of Europe and America, performing classics of literature to sell out audiences. Grace was continually looking for ways to express herself creatively. And she had hobbies. She created uh, pressed flower arrangements, and these are actually published in a book. And she also did poetry readings. Princess Grace gave a revealing interview to Desert Island Discs in 1981, admitting how much pleasure the readings were giving her. You've been giving poetry recitals. Yes, this is something I started a few years ago, and it's uh, I've enjoyed it very much. It's been very pleasant, and uh, it's something that I can do without uh, being away from Monaco for you know any long period of time. People still realise that she had an innate talent and uh, ability, and that they really wanted to still see her. And um, you know, she was a great supporter of the arts, of ballet, and the performing arts. Um, in her role as a princess. In 1977, Grace's love of ballet gave her the opportunity to make a renowned Russian ballet school. The film you're going to see is about the children of Theatre Street in Leningrad. Grace had wanted to be a dancer in her teens, and ballet was still very close to her heart. This touching film was among the nominees for Best Documentary Feature at the 1978 Oscars. This is where all that effortless grace began. Only years of study and practice can make the ballet movements look unstudied and natural and perfectly confident. Grace brought real prestige to the film and is said to have donated her fee and a portion of the takings to support an academy of dance in Monaco, which still bears her name. Grace understood that she was privileged. She, she got that. And so she tried to use her privilege uh, as best she could in helping children in particular, in being a patron of the arts. And I think in that, she was a good person. She was never able to satisfy herself on the scale, or anything remotely like the scale that she was used to in Hollywood. Grace's creative pursuits were often framed in the press as her desperate attempts to escape from a controlling husband. I think there's no question that there were undoubtedly ups and downs because she was trapped in a gilded cage by the very nature of the job. You could think of it as a gilded cage. I don't think her life was like that at all. And I think she was actually a very hard-working and professional person all her life. There were reports that Rainier and Grace endured a loveless marriage and rumours that both were having affairs, which had been repeated in numerous books and tabloid articles. 
it's a shame in a way that if you're a famous and beautiful person, any time you're photographed with somebody, it's assumed that you're being intimate with them. They're often just friendships. There were rumors of various, uh, what they used to call toy boys, and she had a flat in Paris, and there were all kinds of stuff about affairs and all of this. She was a good person, and she didn't hurt anybody. In her lifetime, Princess Grace was aware of all these unproven stories and felt powerless to stop them. She understood that public figures are subject to press speculation, but sometimes she pointed out the excesses of tabloid invention, as in this Frank interview from 1982. You know, if you believe some of the things, I would have had at least 52 babies by now. For many years, I was always expecting a baby, according to the press, or that my husband and I are constantly being divorced, which also is not the case. To uh, put words in our mouths that are not true, or to quote us on things that we have never said, then I resent that. And uh, unfortunately, there's very... It's thought that in the contract Grace signed with Rainier in 1956, she agreed that if their marriage should ever end, it would result in her losing access to their children. Divorce was an impossibility, because if she had divorced, the children would stay with her husband that she wouldn't even have necessarily have access to them because they would be regarded as part of the, the Monaco's royal establishment. After a lifetime of facing down colourful tabloid stories, Princess Grace was a veteran of handling the press. In 1981, she read poetry at a gala event in London in front of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer. The charity concert at £50 a ticket was in aid of the Royal Opera House and one of the performers was Princess Grace of Monaco. She, of course, is very experienced at this sort of occasion. She also knows how to give a helping hand to a newcomer. This was Diana's first public event since her engagement, before the intimidating glare of paparazzi cameras. David Emmanuel designed the dress she wore that night. I think it was possibly at that stage a bit too much for Diana, and uh, Princess Grace gave Diana a piece of advice, and I apparently I quote, um, don't worry, dear, It'll only get worse. And of course it did. I think that Grace was a very maternal person. Her eldest daughter, Caroline, was close in age to Diana herself. Grace is still an actor. So she would have known intuition and instinctively what Diana needed to hear. Because Diana made some comment about the attention. It's really quite a moving set of footage to see this woman who knows exactly what's ahead of Diana to meet her at this stage when Diana really has no idea what's ahead of her. She made the news, and when she didn't make the news, in her mind, the news was made up about her. She did not really understand exactly how much of a bubble you live in, like Diana did not, like Meghan Markle did not. Away from the rumours about her unhappy marriage, Princess Grace was also said to have faced health issues during her later years especially migraines, possibly connected to her lifelong issue of poor eyesight. She also had a minor car crash. She had been involved in an accident driving uh, a black London taxi cab, which was owned by the royal family in Monaco. It wasn't a major accident. She hit another car. But that led to the theory that she was never comfortable behind the wheel of a car. Later, tabloids like the National Enquirer would go much further. In its famously salacious style, the paper claimed that before her death, Grace was trapped in a nightmare world of tranquilizers, depression and loneliness. But also have been a sign of other health issues. She was in her early 50s, perhaps the time of the menopause. There were stories that she was lonely. There were stories that she was depressed. Um, I think keep three kids in order and trying to make sure they're happy and they're not doing things they shouldn't do. It's going to be hard. Perhaps the most surprising story of all was that Grace allegedly joined a cult, the Order of the Solar Temple, which had branches all over Europe and Canada. They filmed their rituals in grainy, poor-quality videos. Filmmaker David Cohen dug deep into the story of Grace's involvement. Grace Kelly had gotten mixed up with an order that was into all kinds criminality under the disguise of spiritual wisdom. When we first got this story, allegation, we were, of course, sceptical. In exchange for the promise of enlightenment, 
devotees were expected to hand over substantial membership fees. The cult was run by Luc Jure, a doctor, and Joseph de Mambro, a businessman convicted of fraud. In their hands, the order had become a front for money laundering and arms dealing. We traced the abbey where this was inducted into the order in a ceremony which was uh, semi, semi-sexual at least. The order made news in the 1990s when disturbing reports showed several of their temples destroyed by fire and 74 devotees dead, including the order's leaders, Jure and de Mambro. As theories shift between murder and suicide, police can confirm they're investigating an international money laundering operation by certain cult members. The story of Grace and the cult was broadcast in 1997. A spokesman for the furious Prince Rainier described it as a cheap shot at someone who couldn't answer back. One of the things that I learnt in in many, many years as a reporter, particularly covering the royal family, is that when journalists get together in large numbers, any number of bizarre stories can come out. Was Princess Grace part of some bizarre cult? Personally, I would regard stories like that as most likely nonsense, most likely fabrications, but who knows? On the 13th of September, 1982, Princess Grace and her daughter Stephanie set off to Monaco from their hilltop home in France. Grace had vowed not to drive again after her previous crash, but she took the wheel and followed a route that one of her movie characters had driven more than 25 years earlier. In Alfred Hitchcock's rousing thriller To Catch a Thief, Kelly gave a thrilling performance while also giving Cary Grant a scare. Slow down. And let them catch us. In the film, they're down the hairpin bends for real to ensure that Stephanie made it onto a train back to school in Paris. She'd had accidents before, maybe didn't drive that frequently. It's very sad that she seems to have been driving the day of the terrible accident. So they go over the hill and it's catastrophic. As Princess Grace and her daughter Stephanie were rushed to hospital, a rumour mill of wild conspiracy theories was already running up to full speed. The mafia was supposed to run Monaco, so they did something to the brakes as a message to Rainier. It couldn't just be as simple as driver error, that there had to be some kind of meaning in it. Princess Grace and her 17-year-old daughter, Stephanie, had plunged more than 120 feet down a cliff face in France and crashed. They were rushed to hospital and initial reports suggested both were stable. Television news reporter Tim Hewitt was sent to cover the accident. Immediately after the crash, the, the royal spokesman in Monaco said very, very little about it. They carried on almost as if nothing had happened. They did not want to cause panic or alarm, and royal press officers in that situation always steer a more cautious path. First, the opinion given not only to the public but to her family in the States was that while injured, she was expected to recover. It was confirmed that fortunately Stephanie was in a stable condition. Princess Stephanie has a broken vertebrae, but she's fully conscious, sitting up in bed and eating normally. If you look at the pictures of that car after the crash, it really is actually quite extraordinary that Stephanie survived. Locals waited desperately outside the palace for news about Grace. The day after the accident, the announcement came. Princess Grace of Monaco had died, aged 52. The palace spokeswoman in Monte Carlo said that when the princess died, her husband, Prince Rainier, and her three were at her bedside. Well, Monica was in a state of shock, a total state of shock. She was a hugely popular figure. This nation went into a complete state of of mourning. She was beloved. Nobody could believe it was over. Her death has stunned the principality. Businesses closed out of respect everywhere. Flags flew at half-mast. Even the famous casino locked its doors until tomorrow. Princess Grace's funeral was broadcast around a million people. It captured the grief as hundreds in Monaco mourned the loss of Princess Grace. 
The Principality of Monaco has been in mourning since Princess Grace died on Tuesday. And today, only the people who live here were allowed onto the streets around the royal palace to watch her funeral procession go by. It was a morning of intense emotion. The princess was an enormously popular figure. Her death has come as a painful blow. Just as her wedding had been beamed round the world, of course, her funeral, those years later, was beamed round the world. This, of course, was the end of the romance, the end of the Cinderella effect. And it was terribly tragic. Whatever mystery may surround the death of Princess Grace is for the moment overshadowed by grief. Doing the job that I was doing, and I did for many, many years, you're frequently exposed to extremes of emotion, people in distress. I, I think that trip to Monaco was one of the more intense that I did because there was genuinely there a quite extraordinary sense of grief. Many, many places that I went to and events that I reported on, I've forgotten, but not this one. Over 400 people attended the funeral at the same cathedral where she was married 26 years earlier. For Ray, Grace had been absolutely the centre of both his private and his public life. So, so, so whatever difficulties there may have been in the marriage, I, I think it, it was a strong union. So I think he was pretty much certainly at the time of her death a broken man. The news reports from the day captured the family's heartbreak. As Rainier walked alongside his daughter Caroline and son Albert, they were caught in the full media glare, unable to hide their anguish. You only have to see the pictures to see how distressed the members of the family were. Prince Rainier was distraught. There were rumors that he would abdicate in favor of Albert, who was still, of course, quite young, because he couldn't go on without Grace. Princess Grace's global impact was clear to see. Family, royalty, celebrities and people the world over were united in the loss. A number of her old friends from Hollywood came. Cary Grant, James Stewart gave the eulogy, saying that she was the nicest person he'd ever known. Grace's life of Hollywood stardom, royalty and tragedy continued to play out even after her death. And apparently it was Princess Diana herself who was very insistent with the Buckingham Palace establishment that she should be allowed to go. Diana herself was to die in a car crash 15 years after Princess Grace. Of course, one of the most tragic elements of the funeral is that Stephanie was still in hospital, not able to attend her own mother's funeral. Following Grace's death, important questions were being asked. Was it an accident? And what really caused the crash that claimed her life? The big rumor at the time was that her younger daughter, Stephanie, was at the wheel, actually, and she lost control of the car. Stephanie eventually said, I've actually lived through the last moments of her life. Can I please be left alone? Following the death of Princess Grace, Monaco was in mourning. But immediately, questions were being asked about what caused the accident that claimed her life, and speculation spiralled. When someone that famous dies young and that suddenly, there's almost a feeling, as with the death of Princess Diana or of James Dean, you know, both also car crashes, that it couldn't just be as simple as driver error. Oh, there were all sorts of rumors, like, you know, the Mafia was supposed to run Monaco, so they did something to the brakes. And then the kind of cult she was supposed to have been a uh, part of, and she was going to blow the whistle on them, and so they took care of her, stuff like that. The palace insisted brake failure had caused the crash, but questions were asked as to why Grace was driving at all. Rainier did not want Grace to drive not just then, but for a long time before that, because she had terrible eyesight and wouldn't wear her glasses, and because she'd been having these debilitating headaches, and because he knew she didn't like driving. Normally, a chauffeur would have driven them, but on this occasion, because there was so much luggage to put in the car, covering the back seat, there was only room for two people in the car. And the chauffeur offered to take them 
and to go back and get the clothing. But Princess Grace insisted that she should drive. There were rumours that Grace's daughter Stephanie was driving at the time of the accident. The big rumour that actually survived at the time was that her younger daughter Stephanie was at the wheel, actually, and she lost control of the car, but she was underage, and so they covered it up. The suggestion that Stephanie was driving came out very quickly after the crash because when the car landed on its roof, the first people to get there to help saw Stephanie emerging from the driver's door of the car. However, a witness came forward confirming he saw... Talk ...to anyone about the accident. She didn't want to talk to the press. She didn't want to discuss it. It's an incredible trauma to go through, to have your mother beside you, and she was blamed for it. It was revealed in the press that Stephanie attempted to stop the car. So the mystery of what happened on the twisting mountain road into Monaco appears at last to have been cleared up. Princess Grace, according to tonight's medical reports, was driving. As the car careered out of control, her 17-year-old daughter, Stephanie, desperately tried to reach the steering wheel. There was nothing she could do, and the rover plunged over a steep ravine. Did the brakes fail? Well, that was one theory. There were no skid marks in the road where the accident happened. Engineers who came over from Rover in the United Kingdom insisted that there was no brake failure. Doctors revealed that Grace had suffered a brain hemorrhage whilst driving. It's thought that although she thought she had her foot on the brake, it could have well been on the accelerator. Stephanie and Grace got in without putting their safety belts on. The car, the fall, had pushed her mother towards the back street, and Stephanie had not been able to get out of her own seat, which had been bashed, so she had to wriggle out of the driver's seat, and she tried to shout, please take us to Monaco. Princess Grace suffered a second hemorrhage in hospital, most likely caused by the accident. The medical staff, led by the hospital director, Professor Charles-Louis Chatelaine, finally had to tell Prince Rain his wife had no hope of recovery. The prince asked for the machine to be switched off. The doctors have said, had she been, you know, at home sitting on a sofa, she might have been fine five minutes later and nothing, nothing happened. Unfortunately, she was at the wheel of a car and that car was on these very bendy roads on the side of these very, very steep cliffs. Stephanie eventually said, I've actually lived through the last moments of her life, really. Can I please be left alone? And Rainier himself said it's tragic enough on its own without repeating these terrible stories. After losing his beloved wife of 26 years, Prince Rainier never remarried. After the funeral, Rainier was really not to be seen and he lived on over 20 years more as a widower. Prince Rainier died aged 81. He was buried next to his late wife in the Grimaldi Royal Family Vault. Grace Kelly embraced her role as princess, but could never escape the goldfish bowl she existed in, fueled by her Hollywood fame. Her movie career, all Hollywood actresses. She's absolutely continued to be a legend. Her star power has never diminished. In a sense, an awful sense, her terrifying death actually just gave another element to her legend. She had an extraordinary life. She had the best of Hollywood. She had the best of royalty. And she actually contributed so much to the small country who will remember her forever. Her presence is felt everywhere, whether it's the Princess Grace Theatre, or her patronage of the arts. And clearly, I think it's fair to say that her name will forever be associated with Monaco. Grace rarely gave interviews, but less than three months before her death, she spoke publicly. In the revealing conversation, she answered personal questions about her legacy. I would like to be remembered as trying to uh, do my job well, of being understanding. No, I'd like to be remembered as a, as a decent human being. When we say that 
Princess Grace was the ultimate fairy tale heroine. Perhaps we remember that fairy tales do have a darker side to them too. It does really seem as though she is someone for whom all the fairies aligned to give her all the gifts that, whether or not they gave her a perfectly happy life, gave her the kind of iconic status that lasts 